Welcome to another Business Analysis Live. My name is Susan Moore. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at IIBA. And my name is Scott Bennett. I'm the Manager of Business Analysis here at the International Institute of Business Analysis. Thank you for joining us live here today. Uh, we've got an interesting subject. It's learning and teaching for business analysis professionals. And Susan, uh, you and I have both talked about uh, as business analysis professionals, we're constantly learning. And that's one thing I love about my job is that part but uh, we might not realize we're also teaching. Yeah, that's right. I, I do think of our job as being professional learners, but along with that, our skills and being able to share that knowledge with other people are really important and maybe not the thing that we always focus on. So I am really excited about our guest today. Uh, she's someone that's been in the IIBA community for quite a while. Uh, we've got Victoria Coupette, she has been not just a, a volunteer in our Europe, Middle East, Africa region. In fact, she was a regional director there for a while, I think. But she's also an author, a trainer, um, a consultant. Like she's she's been doing business analysis for a long time, and she is one of our very newest IIBA board members. So welcome, Victoria. Welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Hi, Scott. Hi, Susan. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited being here, especially because of the topic, which I'm passionate about. <laughs> right. We've totally got the right person if we want to talk about learning and teaching because you've got a PhD in education as well. I, I didn't even mention that among the many, <laughs> many accomplishments that you have. Yes, that was my personal goal. Just another checklist. <laughs> Happy it is done. Final. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so welcome. And also just a reminder to our audience that we're live today and we're going to leave some time to make sure that we answer your questions about learning and teaching. So That's right. where do we start with this topic? I mean, it's it's kind of big, right? Yeah, yeah we talked a little bit earlier about where do you start learning? And let's start from the very start, learning a new rule. That's probably a, a very challenging thing um, in a number of jobs I've worked through, people describe it as drinking from a fire hose. Um, you, you've, you get overwhelmed with having to learn so much information. Victoria, what type of guidance would you give people about learning a new role and, and, and how to tackle that? Yeah, that is a very, very common scenario, especially in business analysis nowadays becoming more and more popular. It's like old already, like it's an established domain, but many people are just starting learning it. So when they become business analysts, they do not know very much what they're supposed to do. So what the rule is, especially because there are so many facets, like there can be system analysts, functional analysts, process analysts, data analysts, and so on. So first struggle is like, how do I learn what I have to do? Yes, and uh, learning a new role is one part of the struggle and then learning uh, what that role is supposed to be in the organization you're working in is a different one. So there can be like a theoretical approach on learning in, in general about business analysis and best practices. You can, of course, study uh, uh, doing self-studying, attending trainings, but also there is like how do one company doing business analysis and then you move to another company and how do they do business analysis so i'm sure susan scott you have witnessed different practices across different companies uh that are like opposing to each other or complementing each other but different yeah and, and i actually love being on a learning curve um i started my career in software development for three years i was a programmer um, and I loved my job up until a certain point and I became certified and then I didn't like my job anymore. I couldn't figure out why. I was very fortunate to work in an organization that had a strong HR department and I went there for some guidance and they did some Myers-Briggs testing on me and it turns out learning is an important part of what I do. It's, it's an important part of keeping me happy and that's where I transitioned into business analysis because our role almost daily is learning something new about what somebody's doing or how a process works. Um, so for me, learning is, is part of what keeps me happy as a person. I don't know why that is, but it just is. <laughs> I, I think it's, you know, this is, you know, we did a, a show on um, curiosity. And one of the questions that we ask ourselves was, is it a skill? Is it a trait? What is it? But I think what whatever, whatever that thing is, I think it's also 
um, about having a willingness in an enjoyment of learning. Is it a skill? Is it a trait? I'm not really sure, but definitely to be successful, I think you have to be able to learn. And loving it really is, uh, it can help with motivation, right, um, to, to want to learn. So. Yeah. Yeah. So after we get over that hump of learning a new role, maybe in a new organization, uh, there's other learning that we do, uh, maybe on a less dramatic basis, um, a little bit about a domain or an industry. Um, yes. How about some strategies for that, Victoria? Because there can be a difference like being a business analyst in banking, fintech industry, yeah, versus in health and care. So it's an additional layer. Yeah, so first is like what actions should they do, what techniques? This is like a role-based knowledge. And then it's like content-based knowledge. Like what is that uh, minimum knowledge that they have to be able even to understand what people say? <laughs> yeah, so this is learning for understanding. Yeah, expectation management. What Learning a new role is expectation management, like understanding what people are expecting from me so I can deliver as expected. And learning a new domain is consuming information in order to make sense of information so that whatever we talk makes sense for other people. <laughs> yes. Okay. And we use it in the right way, in the same way across industry. So, uh, of course, there are challenges because um, in both learning a new role and learning a new domain, if you are like zero, zero in that domain, uh, you may need like theoretical knowledge, but that's not enough. That you need practice. You need practice and a lot of feedback that you are learning correctly. And it's frustrating. I, you mentioned, yeah, like a little bit of frustration, attention. Yeah. And you, Scott, mentioned that you love learning because you love this tension. Yeah. You love this excitement. <laughs> yeah. Some people are bored doing the same thing many, many years and they switch the domain. Yes. It's interesting that you mentioned that. So I, I teach people about woodworking and I use an equation about learning and that is knowledge plus experience equals a skill. So how do you build a skill? I'll put that up here. Um, so knowledge is understanding the theory, but if you've got the theory, you don't have the experience, you don't have a skill. If you've got experience, but you don't have the right knowledge, you're not really going to be skilled. So when I when I communicate this, it's it's not just understanding something; it's actually doing it as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's that's important for people to realize that there's theory and then there's practice, and you need both of those to really become good at something. And and Susan, that probably relates to the dance that you do, right? It, it, most definitely. Um, when I've taught dance classes in the past, and I would have new students, um, you know, they would be. It might, it might be their first time in a dance studio and it might even be their first time dancing. And, you know, we're, even though I'm breaking things down for them so that they can learn the choreography, one of the challenges I think to learning can be our own frustration at, at the pace at which we learn. Um, because, you know, just like your equation says, I've got to have knowledge, but I've also got to have some experience. And, you know, Let's, let's kind of talk about the brain science for a second. What happens when you're learning is that your cognitive processes are taking that thing that you've just learned in short-term memory and they're filing it away in long-term memory. Well, if it's something you've never done before, that process takes a little bit longer, but your brain's really working. Externally, it can feel like, oh, I'm not getting it or, oh, I'm, I'm the slowest person in the class. And that can be that can learning under pressure like that, uh, like we sometimes have to do in organizations, can be very demotivating, <laughs> quite frankly. But I see it a lot, and I just try to tell people, hang in there. Like you can learn this, you've just got to build, you've got to practice. And it is so true for many of the skills um, that we use as business analysis professionals. Yeah, and, and so rewarding when that finally clicks and you get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you got to hang in there for it. Yeah. So a healthy dose of frustration is needed in learning because if you are reading a material and everything makes sense, you actually learn nothing. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, boring. I already know this. But when you are struggling to understand, this is your learning, actually. This struggling, this frustration. I was recently listening to a podcast about neuroscience and neuroplasticity. 
And um, the, there was like a dialogue between scientists and they said, like, if you're learning a language that is close to your language, like English is Germanic language. So if you learn another Germanic language, you may struggle a little bit, but it will be kind of like a doable struggle. Try, try learning Chinese <laughs> or something that is far away from English or from your native language. You will be highly frustrated. But that is where your brain is expanding. So mm -hmm. for health of our brain, we need expansion. We need learning, but not being comfortable. OK, not mm -hmm. being comfortable. Yeah. And speaking about dancing and woodworking, um, there is um, practice needed, like a skill uh, measuring skill like how well accurate your measurements are before cutting or how well you are doing a particular movement but in soft in soft um skill learning yes especially like business analysis is a lot of soft uh aspect um you need to anchor it into practice and if you're a beginner and you don't really have practice in the past past practice then it's difficult. So I always say when I'm in a training situation to the students, imagine. Imagine you would have this situation. Imagine you would have a project or they just e create a project, a pixel project, but imagine it's real <laughs> and apply the knowledge. Application. Application is very important. And of course, frequent feedback and openness for feedback, not being afraid of mistake mm. self-irony <laughs> sitting on your mistakes like uh, laughing yourself on your mistakes that is healthy attitude on learning yeah it really is and, and you bring up something else that's really um that's really important is being coachable right because none of us are perfect in everything but if you have an openness to learning and an openness to take feedback even though it can be difficult to hear you will find that that is the thing that gets you better at it it's just you know it's it's um it's a really good trait to have or skill or whatever we're defining this as today it's a good one to have yeah good point yeah so let's switch gears a little bit from the learning to the teaching so uh, you know as business analysis professionals we might not think of ourselves as teachers but we are communicators we absorb information we also have to share information um, so there are different ways that we can do that and victoria um, you are the definite expert at this um, how can we share knowledge in an impactful way or teach in an impactful way mm -hmm. so let's first discuss the difference because i think you can share knowledge and i can teach that knowledge what is the difference when i'm sharing i can say guys this is the information take it do whatever you want with it that's sharing but if you are teaching you need feedback that the audience understands yeah they understand what you are sharing this is the difference and now you need to think okay what are the needs what the audience needs uh as from the point of like format way of presentation so some people are visual learners so you need to visually share information in a visual way some people are kinesthetic learners so you need to give them context a lot of details yeah so like a graph or a powerpoint with few bullet points will may not be enough some people are auditory have auditory preference that means that they enjoy stories tell me stories so when you share yes when you share you need to be aware of like who am i sharing information with is it more like a teaching that i'm doing so i need to collect feedback or is it more like a broadcasting yeah broadcasting information and integrating learning styles as well yeah one thing i've, I've realized over the years is i'm a visual learner so i always mm -hmm. gravitate to understanding graphics and when i think through things i draw them out and when i communicate i draw them out but it's only one way of learning, right? If, if I'm always communicating that one way, it might not resonate well with everyone I'm speaking to. Yes, yeah. It's definitely yeah, it's targeting a group. <laughs> segmentation. <laughs> you just need the segmentation. 
<laughs> mixing up styles. So, so just thinking about all of the, the, the audiences that we have to communicate to as business analysis professionals, we often talk about tailoring your message, but, and we often think about the groups, but you also need to think about the styles as well. So when you have a combination of visuals and words and things that people can touch or do, you know, you really build the, the ability to get not, not only engagement, but also learning. So mix it up, I think is what we're saying when, when you're putting your communication plans together. Yeah. yeah. And when I think about learning, like to me, auditory is really low on my list. Mm. And, and when, I, when I'm trying to learn that way, I realize how much it's not resonating with me. But as soon as I switch to visual, it's bang on. I have to remember as a communicator, if I'm just communicating visual, I could be doing that same boring thing for someone else who's auditory. So yeah. it's, it's really important to mix them up. Uh, Victoria, are there, is there a general um, summary of what those learning styles are? Are there three? Yeah, so there are like three main ones. Yeah, but people, they have mixed. Yeah, so it's not like you are just bad. They have a okay. preference that is natural for them. Okay, so they can be all of them, but something is natural. So for instance, how you can uh, see... <laughs> I'm using you. How can you see somebody's preference? So if you're talking to somebody and that person, while you're talking, is looking at you, that person may be a visual because the kinesthetic may do doodling, may oh. do something else and not looking at you. And that doesn't mean that not, they're not listening. They have ears to listen. Okay. Visuals listen with their eyes. If they don't see the message, the source of the message, they cannot hear it. Kinesthetic okay. people and auditory people, they have years <laughs> to listen. So yeah. that can be one clue because when you're communicating, and see that somebody's not looking at you. Somebody, a special visual person may feel like, oh, they're not listening. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Especially if it's, the message is important and interesting. Yeah. So Susan, you are doing, your message is always interesting. Like how do you make something sound like not boring, even if it's like or just a podcast, speaking about auditory people, yeah? Like there are people who love podcasts. So how, what's your secret? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we do consciously make sure that what we're communicating about is not visual. So there's no presentation yeah. in our podcast, right? Because we do have an audio based um, uh, listener base. Um, it's important that what we're talking about makes sense if you're only listening to it. Yeah, I do think that's the important piece. Um, I think the other thing too is we want, we do focus on how people feel. It's important, Victoria, for you today to feel comfortable. Um, and we, you know, because that makes our conversation more natural, more accessible, more approachable. And we believe that that also translates into what the audience hears, that they're hearing, you know, uh, a chat that they might hear in their off audience. So we, we sometimes talk about how to making sure everyone is comfortable. So it's tone of voice, it's how loud, how quick, how slow we talk. So that is also a skill. Yeah. So let's say you're talking to a group, you need to be uh, to include variations. Yeah, like talking fast while talking slow, kind of like waking up people and then calming down. <laughs> yeah, so they will not be one. But when you're talking one to one, then you need to mirror the other person. So if the other person is talking fast, that means they need information to be in the same pace. Mm, if the person okay. is talking slow, that means they need like they're processing information at the same rate. So you are showing when you emit a signal, how you receive the signal. Yeah, even the volume is important. Yeah, oh. I, that's that's a, a really good point is, is and I, I, I think it's listening, but I feel like what you're describing is listening with all of your senses um, to know how best to communicate with someone. Because I'm hearing you say, you've got to listen with your ears, but also your eyes and your heart and your brain and your body. So it's it's like, it's big listening. Is that a term? Let's trademark that. Big <laughs> That's what you got to do. Make a t-shirt. Big listening. That's <laughs> but also Scott, as a visual person, you may communicate with your hands, like to make sure that there is something <laughs> visually represented. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 And that can be me, by the way. Also, I wanted to go back to something that you said, because I, I often, I'm, I'm a note taker. So you mentioned sometimes when, when you're, you know, to watch people, because sometimes what they're doing will tell you the way that they listen. I'm a note taker. And so oh. as you guys are talking, I am writing all of these notes in part and it's not necessarily like I'm, I'm taking notes of what you're saying, but you inspire ideas in me. And so sometimes I'm, I'm capturing those ideas because they help me to connect with the message and, and continue the conversation. So you're right. Also, just to the audience that's watching us, I'm not playing with my phone. I am just taking <laughs> That's my style. That's how I that's how I learn. I need to like tact, I have a tactile piece to, to what I learned. And I think that's great to share, Susan, because mm -hmm. if people can learn how they absorb stuff best and make use of that, they're going to be more successful at it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And in this virtual world that we live in, right, we usually can only see from our head, maybe to mid chest. It, you maybe can tell that I'm, I'm writing, maybe you can't. Um, but so I do think that that's, one of the cues that you could use in virtual body language to, if if I'm not sure, I could say, I could have an offline conversation and say, Susan, are you, you know, taking notes? How about, did what I say make sense? And maybe we could get into a conversation about that, that learning style. Um, so, you know, use, use your, your, your clues, yeah. I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. For sure. Okay. And, and sometimes learning can be difficult. Um, so let's talk a little bit about motivation for learning um, and, and how that's important. Um, yeah, of course. You're so right because learning is, unless you are hunting for information and the learning is part of your daily routine and you want to consume a lot of information for expanding purposes, not social media, just uh, scrolling, uh, then you may have an intrinsic motivation. Yeah, it's like, okay, I want to learn something new. I want to keep my brain plastic, yeah, neuroplasticity. I want to stay young. But then there is ex extrinsic motivation. Yeah, like uh, when a colleague of yours gets certified and like, oh, he did it. I want also. Or when there is like a trend happening <laughs> and you want to be on the trend or when you want like a salary increase or when it is like a something that is time pressure. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it kind of pressures you into taking action and not uh, delaying uh, the learning part. Yeah. 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 And speaking of, this is a good timely uh, reminder. Uh, we do have a promotion going on right now, 20% off every exam. Uh, you can check out more at iiba.org slash exam rebate. I believe it's also on our homepage. So check that out. Yes. So there it is. There's some extrinsic motivation. If you were <laughs> thinking about getting certified, there's, there's, uh, there's maybe something that might entice you a little bit. And you know, that motivation, Motivation is what makes learning um, as adults different from learning as kids. Um, you know, that's one of the ways we were talking about another way before we before we uh, started today, that there's how you learn. And I think it's something important if you are teaching is using metaphors and analogies with adults because adults have a, li a lived experience so they can understand things. Whereas you mentioned with children, it's it's different. It's about storytelling. I don't know if you want to go into that. I thought that was a really interesting uh, yes. point that we talked about. So that's the difference between pedagogy and andragogy. And pedagogy, pe uh, kids do not have ownership on their learning path. They are like every informa information is given to them, and the order of the uh, the path is decided by an adult. So the child is very much obedient and listens to whatever the authority, parent, educator uh, uh, is giving. An adult uh, has choice to learn or not to learn. And they have choice what they want to learn. And the, to make something relevant, hmm. it should be relevant to the experience. Okay, yeah. so if you try to teach an adult something that is not relevant, they will not even hear the message because our brain is such a good filtering. Yeah, like you have lenses and if it doesn't fit my needs, whatever my needs are, 
I will not even hear it. I will be present physically and absent <laughs> conscious. My conscience would be somewhere else. Yeah, I would not even be hearing you because it's not relevant. So to make something relevant to an adult, you need to motivate them. You need okay. to explain them. I will give you an example. I graduated an IT uh, faculty in an economical university. And I was really passionate about technology and I hated all the subjects that were not related to technology, mm -hmm. like accounting. I hated the topic. <laughs> it would not stick to me. I would not understand anything. And then exam was approaching. And because I'm such like so fond of uh, psychology from early ages, I was like, I need to trick my brain. What can I do to trick my brain? Let's imagine I will be owner of a company or a freelancer and I need to do my own accounting. And suddenly it became very, very relevant. And I took really? myself into learning. And now I'm using, since I'm a freelancer for like 13 years now, I'm using what I learned in the university in the most hated topic that I had. <laughs> so trick wow. your mind. <laughs> I, really you know what? I think this is this is uh, this is interesting. So I'll I'll tell a story, a very quick story from my past as well. Um, I also am not into math, and most traditional ways that I think I I learned math as a kid just didn't resonate for me. But when I was in high school, I was taking a required math class. It was some sort of advanced math class, and I was taking a computer programming class. And I I had just programmed this computer to do. I forget the kind of equation it was. It was a very specific equation and I had just programmed the computer to solve it. And almost the next day we had a pop quiz in the advanced math class and that equation was on it. And I literally walked through my code in my head and answered the, the, the problem. And of course I knew I had it right because I knew the answer. But when my teacher came over, she said, you got this right, but I have no idea how all of this got to the answer but it works so oh. that so that was a clue way back then that maybe i needed to be in it but i do think it is about application so i realized that it wasn't that i didn't understand math i understood it perfectly i needed to i needed it to be in a different way um and so that was kind of a clue that unlocked and i really wish that she, that teacher has passed on but i really wish she was still around so i could tell her that that made a difference in my career choice. That oh. that story, yeah. Nice. So, yes. yeah. Well, yes. I tell you what, we have we have been getting some questions and some comments today. What do you think? You wanna you wanna go over and start to take take some audience feedback? Yeah, let's jump into that. All right. Well, let's see. Here is the the first item we have. This is uh, uh, Chinedu. Um, so this is uh, earlier when we were talking about um, if there's nothing that toggles your brain, then you're not learning. Remember, we were talking about like the work that your brain has to do and, and the struggle is part of the process. I remember when I first started my journey into management, considering my background in law, it was it was difficult to grasp the terms. But then I knew I was really learning. I think that's important because so many business analysis professionals come from something else and get into business analysis. And very often they think I have no skills. I have I, I'm really starting from scratch. What do you guys think about that? Because that's one of the learning challenges that I think business analysis professionals face. Victoria. When I think about it. Not so for so long, Scott. <laughs> you have an opportunity to share. <laughs> when I think about the, the deep learning and challenge, the one thing that I noticed is the physical energy level it takes for learning. So back in the day when I learned project management, I was on a five-day course. I was exhausted every day, but I was sitting in a seat and I was learning. And I thought it was a really interesting physiological experience that it's my brain that's working really, really hard, but I'm mm -hmm. so tired. And, and I've experienced going into new roles in different organizations and having that experience as well. It's, it's, it, there's so much going on. You're learning so much. I'm really happy, um, but it's really exhausting to, to get through that. So for me, that was an indicator of learning, but I'm sure there are other indicators too that people are, are learning. And yeah, also there's need, need for reinforcement because many times people are going to this like crash course 
yeah and then like learn a lot in very condensed um time period and if they do not repeat either in practice or coming back just theoretically it will disappear our brain has limited capacity and it's very smart in releasing the information that is not relevant or perceived as not relevant <laughs> again that's very much coming back to the relevance you, you know on that note we've got a um, a question from joe here can can one of us talk about a situation where we learn something and then we applied it um, in a work situation. I know we've, we've talked about our, our hobbies, but do you guys have a, a work situation where you can uh, describe this behavior? In my case, that was every project. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm freelancer, I'm not picky. I'm just saying, okay, I have my skills, like technical skills. So whichever opportunity comes to me, I, I see challenges as opportunities. Yeah, I'm accepting all of it. <laughs> and I um, very seldom had two clients in the same industry even. Yeah, I think this is such a luxury to have multiple <laughs> projects in the same industry because you feel like you know it. But in my case, I need to quickly learning a lot. And nowadays, it's so easy because we have AI to help us. Like I remember Googling and searching for books and reading books. And before YouTube existed, to all like to read the whole book. Then with YouTube, I will search for those like intros or tutorials or like condensed versions of studying like YouTube. And now I just go to AI and I ask specific questions and I dig deeper and deeper and guys i'm using mind mapping i'm mapping my brain i'm mapping my knowledge so i discover a branch like ai tells me something like oh that's like would be the vocabulary you need to know because i always start in a new domain with vocabulary like what do they know and it gives me a list and they're like okay that's mind map like branches let's go deeper let's go deeper and let's go deeper and then then i have this knowledge tree or forest let's call it knowledge forest <laughs> Yeah. And then I was like, okay, that's my knowledge. <laughs> yeah. So it's on, it's not enough to learn. It's it, also, you need to reinforce and Susan, what you're doing by making notes is reinforcing. Yeah. When some people are like doodling for reinforcing visuals or doodling for reinforcing, uh, kinesthetic people are writing for reinforcing or doing modeling. We have so many modeling techniques, mind mapping being one of them. So that is reinforcing. Okay. I'll yeah. share uh, an experience of mine about data analytics. Um, we were working on something two years ago here at IIBA to introduce data analytics and making decisions based on data. Uh, so a little bit of self-promotion here. Here's my certif <laughs> certification, uh, certification in business data analytics. Um, and it was uh, really timely. And I think timeliness is part of this equation, right? So if you're learning something purely out of interest and to your point, Victoria, you don't reinforce it, you're going to lose it. So. I was doing this certification on data analytics because we were starting this new capability in our organization. So I was learning new things, but able to apply them immediately. Um, so it, it helped on two fronts. It helped on my learning path and in sort of pulling me along, but it also helped in the job role, in the job role that I do every day. Uh, myself and another business analyst here at IBA, we both went through it together. Um, so I think if you're looking at learning something, uh, making sure that you can use it somehow um, will help you retain that and, and even get better at it. Yeah. And the best way for learning is teach, teach whatever you're learning. That's right. Yeah. So in my case, it's very strange because I have been certified for like since 2010 CBAP, yeah, so multiple recertifications. So I knew BA Block. I also contributed as an author to the new version to BA Block, but actually understood the book after I started teaching it. <laughs> okay. Because when I was writing it as other contributors, I knew very well my area. And then I kind of understood the other areas, but kind of like, okay, on a very superficial level, enough to pass the exam when i started teaching it oh my gosh you cannot escape the question <laughs> and then you struggle making up stories in your mind that will make sense to you and then they will make sense to other people so you will own a domain after you start teaching it yeah not for money just like mentoring people like mentoring speaking about sharing information 
Yeah, you can be a mentor, you can be a coach, you can be a trainer, like internal trainer in, orga in organizations. Yeah, but sharing helps understanding. <laughs> I, a lot of people feel like, oh, I don't want to mentor others or coach others because I don't know this topic, but you're exactly right. And that's even what science shows. One of the best ways for you to really learn something is to have to teach it because you are going to get questions. You are going to, you're going to have your own questions and you've got to dive deeply. So teach, teach something that you sort of know about. Um, it'll, it will, it will really apply that learning. So, all right. So let's let's keep moving here. Um, again, we've we've got we've got comments mixed in with questions today. So let me share a few of the comments that we've had. Here's um, a comment from Nicola: being comfortable using failure is a positive way to learn. I, I think that's really important. Stop thinking of failure as you didn't learn something. Trust me, you learned something <laughs> when when you encountered the failure. Learn to accept that. And I feel like as a dancer that is getting older. I am I am fully embracing uh, kind of where I can't do things anymore. And it doesn't mean I can't dance. It just means I need to modify or I need to try it again. Yep. Um, Nicola also added this. I think BAs are teachers. We have that special skill set and our brains are trained. We need to teach our stakeholders. Usually uh, there's a lot of repetition in that teaching, but we also need to under understand their motivations and learning styles. So being able to communicate um, in order to share knowledge is just a critical part of what we do. Um, also, shout out to Connor because um, he started the hashtag big listening. <laughs> Thanks, Connor. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let's see. Um, let's, we also, uh, Chinedu followed up with this session is super amazing and timely because I'm hosting a business analysis webinar. Um, on this topic, he, he, there were some other comments that he added, but this is something that he's thinking about. So good luck on that talk. Let's see, here's another one. Um, hashtag paraphrasing, catering to a diverse audience is a great way of doing it too. You know, you, um, Victoria, you mentioned some techniques, which I thought was great because we usually get that question here. What are techniques that I can incorporate into either learning or teaching? What about paraphrasing? Uh, paraphrasing is uh, an elicitation technique, actually. So when we are eliciting information, we need feedback that we understood the information that we hear. So hearing is one and understanding is another one. So let's say you are telling me, Scott, something about woodworking. And I was kind of understanding, kind of like, okay, so I would tell you what I understand, but differently, not like a copy paste way because if i'm just repeating what you just said it's me feedback that i heard you but if i'm paraphrasing that's me feedback that i understood but also um paraphrasing also can mean like changing the abstraction level because when we talk to about top management we really need to have keep it high level yeah not going in details when you go deeper you need to uh, add more and when you go even deeper, like technical people, you you change the message, the format of the message, and that's paraphrasing. But also to give a funny story, speaking about giving back <laughs> to your certification, <laughs> CBDA certification, I was teaching a class on CBDA for non-tech people, for managers. You can understand the struggle of explaining technical, highly technical, algorithm to a non-tech people who would never use it in their life so the struggle was real so i asked JGPT to say help can we explain this like to a teenager hmm. okay okay so the ability to explain complex a complex concept in an easy way is also like paraphrasing almost but it's simplifying by using analogies yeah, so it, I like the statement, if you cannot some, explain something to a child, that means you don't understand it. <laughs> so basically, it's a way of checking if you really understand a concept. That's <laughs> very, for that. <laughs> very interesting. Um, a, a bit of a research hack. Uh, I was studying climate change um, and I was looking how to teach it to people. Um, and I went to the children's book section in the library and I got out a bunch of books that were on climate change. 
And they were so crystal clear in terms of how they communicated that I realized, well, this is how you communicate to the average adult that doesn't understand this. I, I, I like what you're saying there. So a bit of a, a research hack, if you, if you can do it, find the children's version of whatever you're trying to teach because it might be a good shortcut. Oh, yeah. I really, yeah, I really like that idea um, because that that really gives you an opportunity to kind of learn it at that foundational level when it's a topic that is really outside of your your knowledge. Great hack. I like that. Um, well, we are, I think, at almost at the end of our time today. But gosh, looking at the the comments that we've had, boy, this topic is really um, resonating with our audience today. Um, I think we have we have informed some folks. So we've actually done a really great job of, of talking about this topic. Um, so maybe we'll have some new teachers out there. Um, yeah, yeah, that'll take right. us back to their work. And, and we are getting to the end of our season here. Um, it's December. Uh, we've got one session next, and, and Susan, I'll leave you to introduce that. But Victoria, we talked when we first got on this call, um, it's St. Nicholas Day. Um, so happy yeah. St. Nicholas Day for those people that uh, celebrate that, acknowledge that. And Victoria, thank you for sharing your expertise today. We'll leave a link in the video description for the YouTube video when it comes out um, so people can connect with you. But uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. And thank you again for all of the volunteer work that you do for IABA. Yeah, thank, thank you for you so having much. me. It was super fun. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, and on our next episode of Business Analysis Live, we're going to be talking about working across cultures. We're an international organization. So this is something that we do quite frequently. And we don't have just one special guest. We have many special guests. So we can't wait for you uh, to hear their stories and to meet them. We will see you again in two weeks. Same time, same place. See you soon. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and we'll leave another one right here for you to help you in your business analysis career. If you haven't subscribed to the IIBA YouTube channel yet, you can click over here and click on the bell icon to get notified every time we publish a brand new video.